This morning we'll be coming from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 45 to 54, and then chapter 12, 9 through 11. But before we read, let us pray. Lord, we come to the reading of your word and we ask that you would bless the reading and understanding of it to our hearts and souls, or that we might understand it and be doers of it. We ask, Lord, that your word would come alive in our hearts by the power of your spirit, that we might live it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. John chapter 11, starting with verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what he had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, What are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. So from that day on, they planned to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked out about openly among the Jews, but went there, from there to a town called Ephraim in the region near the wilderness. And he remained there with the disciples. And we move down to chapter 12, verse 9. When the crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and believing in Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. Salesman was driving down the road and out in the middle of nowhere, not paying much attention when all of a sudden a man dressed completely in yellow, head to toe, stepped out in the road. So he slammed on the brakes and uh, he said, uh, rolled down the window and said, who are you? And the man said, I am the yellow idiot of the highway <laughs> and I am thirsty. Do you have something to drink? So the man said, okay, and he found a soda and handed it out to Wendy to the man. The man said, that will do, thank you, walked off into the desert. So shaking his head, the salesman drove on down the road and, and came across somebody dressed all in green, head to toe in green. He slammed on the brakes again and rolled down his window and said, who are you and what do you want? And the man in green said, I am the green fool of the highway, and I'm a little hungry, you have anything to eat? So he looked around and he found half a bag of chips and he said, it's all I've got, but you're welcome to it. And the man in green took him and said, thank you very much, and walked off. He drove down a load of the road a little further and all of a sudden there was a man dressed in blue in the road, so he slammed on the brakes again. Any time rolled down the window getting used to the procedure by now, and he says, let me guess, you're the blue idiot of the highway, why do you want? And the man in blue said, your driver's license and registration. <laughs> It was probably a bad decision on the part of the, the man in the car to assume. But based on his experience on that road, having run into somebody in yellow, somebody in green, somebody in blue, it would be about the same. Uh, he assumed he was the same as the others, and that no doubt got him into trouble. Uh, sometimes we in our own lives can get so into a frame of mind that we can assume things, and then making assumptions we can get things wrong. And we do that because we can look at how things have always been and how they are, and we might assume they will always be that way. And sometimes, especially uh, as religious folks, as, as believers, we can sometimes make spiritual assumptions based on what has always been so or seemed so, maybe even sometimes what we've been taught, and sometimes it may not even be biblical. It might just be something that we've heard others say all of our lives, so we think it's so. Uh, and sometimes we can get to the point that even when we think we're making the right choices, we may be, because of our assumptions, 
missing the big picture and thus end up making the wrong decision. Whenever I read the New Testament, I'm always struck at all of the wrong decisions that are made by people who are supposed to be the smartest people in the room. The high priest, you know, the chief priests and the elders, the chief council members, scholars, priests, religious lawyers, the Pharisees, they were all in the positions they were in because they had in some way earned their way there. They were thought to be the best and the brightest the purest and most righteous and most learned, particularly the most learned as it came to the scriptures and to the ways of God. Uh, and so they were put into those positions. Now, you know, with any system, there undoubtedly were some people who had worked their way in there because they were rich or because they came from a powerful family or because they intrigued their way to the top somehow. You always got those. But most of them, as products of their system, truly were the best trained, maybe the most talented and knowledgeable, and so they were entrusted to making the big decisions. But they chose wrongly, time and time again, as we see in the scripture, as we see particularly in the scripture we read this morning. At a critical moment in their life, uh, probably the most critical moment, they missed Jesus completely. They missed God's exclamations showing who Jesus is over and over again. They were supposed to know the scripture, which they did to the letter, but they misunderstood it and misinterpreted it to the point that they missed the Messiah they were looking for when he came. Here they are in today's scripture talking about all the signs that Jesus is doing. Jesus is working many mighty miracles, even to the point of raising Lazarus from the dead. Now, you would think that seeing these miracles, particularly somebody raised from the dead, they might think just for a moment, maybe this is the one. Maybe this is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. All these miracles are signs pointing to that. But when we read today's scriptures, we see they don't do that. They talk right over the miracles that Jesus has been doing, and they consider them to be problems to be confronted rather than signs of God to be accepted. And they are so blinded by their long wait for the Messiah that when he actually comes, there they are still in waiting mode to the point that they are willing to consider killing Jesus and even Lazarus, whose only crime is to have been raised from the dead uh, for the reason, just sole purpose, to get rid of them. Murder, and particularly the murder of innocent people, was as much an abomination then as it is to us now. And here we have the supposedly most religious people contemplating it, planning it, and eventually carrying it out. And thinking that they're making the right decision in doing so, according to their excuse, because, well, it's for the good of the people, even if they don't know it. How did they get into this situation? How did they get into this bad a shape? How have they exchanged spiritual insight for blindness? How have they exchanged true righteousness for legalistic religiosity? And why in the end did they choose Rome, and they did choose Rome, which they hated, over Jesus? Why in the end did they make that decision? <clears throat> Well, I know in the end, of course, the answer is not a simple one because humans are not simple people. You know, human beings are very complicated and very confusing, and there are a great many factors in all of our lives uh, that come into play into what we do and why we do it, and some of them we don't even understand. Uh, so there are many different reasons. I don't want to make it simplistic. But I believe that one of the central problems that these folks had is that they were making assumptions and basing their decisions on these assumptions. And in doing so, they were wrong. They assumed what sort of leader the Messiah was supposed to be. Messiah was, they assumed, to be a great general who would come and overthrow the Romans and restore Israel to its earthly glory, like back in the days of King David. They had no idea that it would be an humble Galilean preacher who would come and overthrow even more powerful enemies of sin and death. Jesus did not meet their assumptions, their expectations, as to what the Messiah was supposed to be. They also had seen a great many 
messianic pretenders and rabble-rousers in their time, all of whom had stirred up the people and then who had perished. And so they assumed that Jesus was just another one of those and that he would be no better than they. Also, some of them, while they talked a great deal about the Messiah, apparently assumed that the coming of the Messiah was just as far off as it ever had been. The Messiah hadn't come in hundreds of years despite the prophecies, and surely he wouldn't come even now, even though the timing was right for it. They might not have consciously thought this. They may have consciously been saying, you know, we expect the Messiah at any moment. But the way they lived their lives showed that they really didn't expect it. They lived their lives as if they assumed that they were in charge and always would be in charge because that's the way it had always been. And they assumed the privileges of their position. And all of this blinded and corrupted them so that when the critical events came, the most critical events in their lives and in the world really, they responded with a decisiveness that reflected the times to the point of believing that even it was okay for them to murder innocent people. Things were so critical, they had a decision to make. They could either accept the miracles as signs of God, accept that Jesus was the Messiah, accept all the changes that that would bring, especially in their leadership, and accept all the risks that that would entail, or they could get rid of Jesus so that things would remain the same as they had always been. They chose to do the latter. And they were dead wrong. Many were still alive 40 years later when one that was accepted as the Messiah came and acted in the manner they expected the Messiah to act as a general who would overthrow the Romans. And they were crushed by the Romans and Jerusalem was destroyed because that Messiah, the one they expected, wasn't the real one. So what does all this mean for us today? Well, a number of things, of course. One of the most important, of course, being that we as Christians believe Jesus is the Messiah, and thus we decide to submit to his lordship. And for those who reject Jesus as Messiah, we might say, check your assumptions. You know, they assume a number of things without them being reality. Also, we can see in this passage of Scripture that the power of evil to blind us is very strong, particularly when whatever it proposes agrees with what we already think or what we want to be so. We as humans are really very good at coming up with excuses to do whatever it is we want to do. You know, whether it be right or wrong, we can find some way to back it up. And, uh, you know, it may not be so. We learn from this also that the smartest and the most righteous people in the room may not actually be the smartest and most righteous people in the room. You know, don't take some authority's word for something just because they say it, just because they have some title or degree to back up what they say, check it out yourself. Because you never know what vested interest some of the smartest and most knowledgeable people may have to move in a certain direction. They may not even know or understand it. But being human, that can be wrong. But the central lesson I want to get to today is what this passage should teach us is don't make assumptions about God based on our human experience, based on our fallible human knowledge, based on our human limitations, but rather seek a newness, a freshness of relationship with God every single day. Every single day, seeking to grow closer to the Lord and to do so by reading the Word and applying it to our lives, and most of all by praying and praying and praying. Prayer is the most important spiritual tool we have, but so often it's the one we least resort to. And we know it's the most powerful tool we have because whenever we try it, it's interrupted, isn't it? We start to pray and something else comes in our mind. Oh, we remember something else we're going to do. Or we start to pray and the phone rings. Or we start to pray and then our back starts to hurt. Uh, You can do about anything you want to, but you start to pray and everything starts to intrude on. But praying is our important spiritual tool. And we need to pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit not to be deceived, but to help us in testing all things, as the Scripture tells us. It is so easy for us as humans to get into a routine. We humans are creatures of routine and habit. 
And that can be a good thing because it keeps us on track rather than running around like a chicken with our head cut off from here and there and doing everything and not getting anything done. And so routines and habits can be good and they can bring us comfort and peace and that's good. But we always need to make sure that our routine has also put us to sleep. <coughs> to put us to sleep in a way that it limits our responses and our options to what has always been so. For God, in truth, is always opening up new doors for us if we but watch for them. And sometimes those doors can open in the most unexpected places and in the most unexpected ways to the most unexpected people. And this can be a bit scary to have to step out in faith on nothing other than the Word of God. But it also leads to an amazing life from the things that God can do. God is not a computer algorithm. He is not predictable. Now, I'm not saying God is chaotic. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that God cannot be put into the limited boxes we sometimes want to put God in so that we feel safer with God. God is not beholden to our routines. There is an old saying, originally in Latin, but in English it is, God is not obliged. That means God is not obligated to follow our human rules and regulations. God is not obligated to follow our human customs and traditions. God is not obligated to our senses of entitlement. God doesn't have to ask our permission to do anything. And while that can be scary sometimes, that can also be very exciting. Because things do not have to be like they always have been. Changes can come. Amazing changes can come. Great changes for good can come. Our God is a God of action that makes things happen. Explosive things, exciting things. And that can be wonderful for us. God can even use bad decisions and bad things which he doesn't cause. But he can use them for the good of his people as scripture plainly tells us. We can see that even this horrible decision made by these leaders to put Jesus to his death was turned around and actually led to our salvation and the defeat of sin and death and the powers of hell. God is not obligated to reach the same conclusions for decisions that we are. They thought they were getting rid of Jesus, but instead of dying and going away, Jesus took the keys to death and hell and opened the way to salvation for all who would follow him. God was not obligated to the leadership decisions of the Sanhedrin, to the high priest Caiaphas, or even to the power of Rome. And he's not obligated today to the power or authority of any human. And thank goodness for that, because his love is now available to any of us, showered upon all of us who will come to him. So if you find yourself in a tiring routine, maybe we need to make sure that it is a good routine and that we're not asleep, spiritually speaking. We need to seek the Lord daily, a fresh walk with him, praying to see things with fresh spiritual eyes so that we see them the way that the Lord does and can see the Lord's handiwork going on around us. Seeking to follow him, not just in the paths we've always walked with him, but in whatever paths he may lead us to. Deus non obligavit. My Latin isn't very good. But God is not obliged. He does, however, love us anyway. And that we can always count on. So in our daily lives, following God, even if he leads in ways unexpected, by paths previously unseen, the decision we have to make is whether to follow him or not. So what is the decision? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you are not obligated to the frailties of our human existence. But in your perfection, which you fill with your love and mercy, you shower blessings upon us, you seek to lead us and guide us into all truth and into righteousness and right things. And we pray, Lord, that you would help to open our eyes and our hearts to the doors you are opening for us. Help us to take your hand and step out in faith, even if it's the scariest thing in our lives, to do what you are calling us to do. For Lord, in the end, you will sustain all that you call. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray.